Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I meet with military veterans to learn about what they do in their civilian career, what they do, how they got there, and advice for any other veteran seeking to do the same. Today is episode number 203 with Elliot Wilson. You never want to burn your bridges. And uh, the tech product manager I resigned on in Los Angeles when I was moving to Chicago to work for my sponsor, Dad. It turns out that uh, I thought I was making a good career move. It was probably the most expensive move I ever made in my life because he ended up being the CEO and co-founder of ZipRecruiter. And so um, I, I had good relations with him. My wife is from L.A. She liked an adventure. She never wanted to move back to L.A. They were headquartered there. But um, when he decided to open up his facility here and he reached out to me, um, I thought that... We, we had never lived in Arizona. It sounded like a new challenge. And I, I told him that as long as I worked for him or a COO, I would, I would resign on this, this really cool opportunity I had at Sherwin. Well, my guest today, Elliot, has a long history in startups, operations, and more. In this interview, we talk about the hiring process and how to play competing offers, offers off of each other in order to get the best outcome possible. We talk about a variety of ways to get a job. I think Elliot embodies many different options on that. We talk about Elliot's experience in the general manager position, a role that may be appealing to many veterans. We talk about changing one's job title from a big company to a small company and how to approach this. And we talk about operations, operations in a tech startup, as well as operations in the cost-driven physical products world. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Elliot Wilson. Joining me today in Scottsdale, Arizona, is Elliot Wilson. Elliot, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thanks. Glad to be here. So for listeners, I wanted to give your background. Um, Elliot is the Vice President of Operations at ZipRecruiter, which is the smartest way to hire and get hired. He started out at the Air Force Academy, after which he served in the Air Force for nearly, nearly three years. He has worked as a Senior Product Manager at Pictage, general manager overseeing 250 employees at Lovejoy, and area director of distribution at Sherman Williams. He holds both an MS and MBA from Loyola Marymount University. Um, so Elliot, maybe to start things off, if someone's on active duty uh, listening to this, how would you explain to them what ZipRecruiter does? Sure. So if you've heard our ads, we brand ourselves pretty loudly as the smartest way for employers to hire. And we cite uh, a statistic that 80% of employers receive a quality candidate from our website within 24 hours. Um, what this basically means is we're, we're a marketplace like a lot of the, the early job boards, but that we use uh, machine learning and some sophisticated intelligence to, to identify the right job seekers and encourage them to apply pretty proactively um, to make those matches faster. And this can be pretty intimidating for veterans because the resumes may not be a natural match for the artificial intelligence. So particularly for the veteran listeners out there, um, I would recommend um, setting up job alerts so that if the AI doesn't find you as a great match, uh, you can still find those opportunities and jump on them early. And then in parallel to that, um, do your networking, jump on LinkedIn, uh, look for those side doors to, to build relationships into those organizations. And how would you explain your role as VP of operations? So uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, I'm an I'm uh, Air Force veteran, so I'm going to use an Air Force analogy to describe that. Um, I see my role kind of like an AWACS plane over the battle space, uh, and it's an absolute blast. Our, our headquarters are in Santa Monica, California, and that's kind of our uh, operations you know, brain trust there. And then I'm out here in uh, Arizona where our primary contact center is, and I, I have the opportunity to oversee our customer service and sales enablement strategy, boots on the ground, and uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and you've had a, um, you know, when we, you and I chatted a, a couple months ago and we were talking about operations and it seems like you're really passionate about operations. What is it exactly that attracted you to an operations role and, and what do you love about that? So, so I mean, when I, when I made the decision to join the military, one thing I always love is solving interesting process problems. And uh, my degree from the academy was in computer engineering. And so process has always been something that's fascinated me. And then I'll, I'll give all the credit for the Air, my training in the Air Force, but being in the Air Force and, and going to an academy, I really fell in love with leading, uh, inspiring, motivating people. And uh, operations is an opportunity where you can both solve problems, but also problems that involve people. And, and that's really, really exciting for me. Ben, uh, could you walk us through, I, I imagine there's no typical day for you, but if you could walk us through a, maybe a representative day, and especially if you can kind of timestamp it to let us know, 
when you're starting work, when you're ending work, and, and trying to get that flavor of what it's actually like to be in your shoes for a day? Sure. So operations tend to go long. They tend to start early or around the clock and go late. And uh, what I've enjoyed doing throughout my career is I like coming in a little bit later and staying later. Um, and it lets me tighten up and make sure that I, I, everything's going well into the next, next day when it's starting. Um, so typically I roll in around 9, 9.30. And I like to spend my first hour walking the floor, um, figuring out what's going on, whether, whether that was walking the floor of a manufacturing operation or a distribution center or a contact center. And uh, I'll use another uh, Air Force analogy, the OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, act. I like doing that throughout my day, but especially in the morning when I'm trying to understand what's, go what's going right and what's going wrong. Um, from there, from uh, about 10 a.m. through about 3 p.m., I have a lot of meetings scheduled, whether it's with product managers back at corporate or various team managers or interviews. And then I really like to spend the, the latter part of my day uh, really doing as much strategic thinking as I can. I like to reserve some white space there. Uh, where I can think about what kind of KPI trends we're seeing, um, what kind of moves we need to make within the organization, uh, reading some some trade journals. So really allowing myself time to think strategically and kind of get out of the tactical weeds. That's great. And, and um, what does it look like, like when it comes to work-life balance? Are you having to travel a lot? Do you have to work on weekends? What's that look like? So I'll, I'll say in the role I'm in now, it's better than it's ever been. Um, operations is a challenge, especially, you know, my, my prior role at Sherwin, it was continuous operations. I had five shifts, uh, and it was a struggle, um, being with a tech company, it's a lot easier. When I started at this company, every, every operational team was, was one shift. And I was really excited about that until about two months later when I took our trust and safety team to continuous operations. Um, but even that, and in doing that, I was able to schedule and set, set the right cultural guidelines that, um, there's really no reason why I or, or the, the leadership team need to be woken up in the middle of the night. Is, is your sense that, um, is it, it with like Sherman Williams, is that more of a physical product versus a digital product that makes a difference in kind of the pace of operations or the need to manage things, you know, 24 seven or what, what made that, or is that something unique about, Zip Recruiter, or, or what made it a little bit more manageable? No, I, I think one of the big differences there is, I mean, Sherwin was was a very highly efficient organization, but it was really managing uptime. Um, and I think up, managing uptime is difficult, whether uh, in, in whatever role you're in. And fortunately, um, here at Zip, I'm not running the IT infrastructure. I think if I was running the IT infrastructure, if I was managing the website's uptime, that that role would be um, pretty time intensive and I'd be glued to my phone. But in the role where I'm managing people, um, primarily people that are, are touching the customer, um, fortunately, the, our customers mostly engage with us uh, during normal business hours. So um, and it's really, I think, more of a function, as well as the fact that I, I'm transitioning from managing a cost center, uh, which is what I had at Sherwin and at Lovejoy, um, to managing a profit center where I'm managing uh, sales enablement and salespeople. Awesome. And uh, one of the things that stood out for me the last time we chatted was you, you've had a very unique career path in getting here. And could you maybe just take us back to when you got out of the Air Force, um, how you approached that first job search, and then just kind of walk us through, um, I'll, I'll probably interrupt you along the way, but walk us through kind of your career from the Air Force and getting to this point. Sure. So I've, I've acquired jobs just about every way you could possibly imagine. Um, my first job out of the Air Force, I started down the, I, I, I tried everything I could. I, I worked job boards pretty hard and I found some really interesting jobs as working on job boards. And I also tried the, the, the GMO transition services, the, the Lucas Group, Orion's, uh, Bradley Morris's of the world. Um, specifically, I used Lucas Group and I, I had a pending offer with uh, international paper um, with Lucas Group that I was able to pin against an offer from a, a pending offer from a, a tech company. I used the international paper to close out uh, that tech company. That tech company was uh, Pictage, and I was with them for a few years. What do you mean by and that? Like just for for someone who's on active duty, like what 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 does that mean to kind of play those offers off of each other? Sure. So I had, I had interviewed with Pictage, and they they kind of told me that yeah, we're interviewing other candidates. We'll get back to you. And then one nice thing about the JMO programs is they're really good about on both sides of the speed dating, kind of giving people tight timelines and expectations. 
And so I had an offer from international paper and I, I had asked to, to buy some time from them. And they, they told me they agreed that I could get back to them by Friday. And so I, I called the hiring manager at uh, Pictage and I said, Hey, I want your job. It's, it's more interesting than the job at international paper. I need to get them an answer by Friday. Um, and, and I, for better or worse, this is my first time at the Air Force. I told them what the offer was at International Paper, and the hiring manager at Epictai says, "Great, we're going to offer you the exact same thing," and I accepted. So, <laughs> if you were, in, in, I, I got the better, jo- in, I got the better job for the the salary I was willing to take at the other company. That's great. I mean, first of all, good good for you, and just even advocating for yourself and asking for that. But I'm wondering if you were to go back and do that again, would you have not disclosed the other offer, or how would you have done that differently? Um, I actually, I actually did do it a little differently later in life. I probably wouldn't have disclosed. I don't think that it helped me at all. Um, I'd also say that it didn't necessarily hurt me uh, when you're trying to get out of the air, when you're, when you're transitioning out of the military, I'd really focus on trying to get the right job of where you want to go. And as long as it's a salary range you're willing to take, um, view that first job almost as grad school, just to build up your skill set and, uh, really position yourself for the long-term future. Um, and, and this, this was a story I wasn't planning to tell. Um, but a couple of years later, 2008 hit and, um, that tech company was in a growth mode and it, it switched from growth mode to cash preservation mode when the recession hit hardcore. And I was one of three product managers in my, my division and they, they did a big cut. And of the three, I was the only one that was left. And I, I later found out that the other guys around me were making considerably more than me. Um, which again, um, be, being being the, the new guy in the industry, not really being high maintenance, just grinding and adding value, uh, it positioned me well not only to improve my skill set, but also to make sure that I made it through that recession with a job. That's amazing. That's so funny. It's um, you know, sometimes you can you can almost negotiate against yourself. Like it's crazy to think of had had you fought for or obtained a higher salary, your head might have been in the chopping block. Not not that that's a uh, uh, recommendation to go for a lower sla- salary, but it's crazy how that can work out like that. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I kind of interrupted your your story of that transition. So you, you play these offers off each other. You join this tech company, Pictage. W- what was it about it that drew you to tech initially? I, I It's problem-solving process. I, uh, I was actually getting an MBA at the time uh, when I was in the Air Force. Um, and uh, I started up a, a Grubhub type website before Grubhub for the Air Force Base and uh, really just enjoyed trying to innovate and disrupt. And so I used that to, to land the job in the, in the tech space. And for someone who may not be familiar with it, what, what's kind of like the overview on that product manager type role? What sort of things were you doing in that capacity? So product manager, it's for a tech company looking to innovate. And I know, know this, is, this is your wheelhouse. But they're kind of the brains of the operation, looking how to how to grow revenue, how to position the product so that it resonates um, really well with the customer base. I was specifically more back-end technical product management in terms of designing and building our offering and um, working with outside vendors and our behind-the-scenes team to make sure that the product worked really well for customers. Yep. it's. I think one thing that's appealing is, um, especially for um, those non-commissioned officers or officers listening who who have had more leadership experience, my my you know outside perspective is that um, you know my my experience on submarines, you're interfacing with every different department, or if you're officer of the deck, or if you're in that command position, you're having to lead diverse teams with specialized knowledge, and the product manager is interfacing with customer support team and the engineering team and they're they're talking to the sales team and they're getting all sorts of different input from different parties and coming up with a cohesive strategy and to me that's always seemed relevant to a lot of the experience that that people who have a leadership position in the military have Mm -hmm, absolutely Um, and so what then took you from from pictage to lovejoy so for, for anybody who's a service academy grad, we, uh, we were all offered a, a family as a home away from home called a sponsor family. And luck of the draw, the family I got in Chicago, they were uh, old Chicago money. And they had a, a family company that had been their family for over 100 years. And they didn't have a fifth generation to run the company. So uh, being, being a process guy that, that loves interfacing with, with people, the opportunity to be mentored by that family, um, they offered me the opportunity to run their family company as, as the fifth generation. 
And so for me, I, at that point, I, I thought I was saying goodbye to my tech career, and I uh, transitioned out to Chicago. Um, I spent six months actually in their German facilities first, and then I came back to Chicago, and I, I worked my way up to, to running that company. Um, and I did that for, for six and a half years. Um, ultimately, that, that family company, the, the family decided to sell the company. The, the company, the, the industry moves, uh, and there's a lot of consolidation happening, and the family was losing its competitive edge. Uh, and it's just a, a good reminder that, that no business is entitled to exist forever. Um, and they, they sold it at a good time. And uh, when, when that was clear that that was going to happen, I uh, went back to the, the military well, if you will. I went to a hiring fair for academy grads called SAC, um, which is the, the five service academies. And at the time, I was actually thinking of starting my own tech startup. Um, I, I was uh, the single breadwinner for my family with two small kids, so that, that weighed heavily on me. And uh, that career fair ended up opening a lot of doors for me. So uh, uh, if, if you have an opportunity to go to SAC, there's also some uh, equivalents if you're not a service academy grad. Uh, Military Mojo is one of them. There's quite a few of them. But I recommend them not only for the opportunities, but also just a, an ability to calibrate what you're interested in and finding side doors into employers. Um, but again, playing one, one employer off another, which I think is a fantastic ability that, that some of these, these conferences allow you to do. Um, I was able to, to uh, squeeze Sherwin Williams by throwing a, a penning off her head by Google under the bus. That's awesome. I love that. It's uh, you know when you're when you're fundraising and you get um, an offer for funding, it's called a term sheet, and they they say the only way to get a better term sheet is to to have another alternative. And I think that what you're describing is the same thing from the job offer standpoint. It can be difficult to justify like, hey, I want to be paid more. But if you have a competing offer, it's like, look, they're offering me much more. I'm going to go with them. It's a better deal. And it gives you a credible way to, to kind of push up whatever you want to. Maybe it's more vacation time or title or salary or equity or stocks or whatever it is. But that's, uh, that seems to be a, a skill that you have employed multiple times pretty well. Right. In, in this case, again, I, I, I didn't actually, it was a little bit different than I actually didn't even wait for the salary. So um, I, I was interviewing with uh, Sherwin and I had earlier in the week, I had interviewed with Google and the way Google works is once they decide to extend you an offer, they have to put your package forward to a board. Um, and they do this to make sure that managers aren't settling and that they decide that this is a candidate worthy of Google. Um, but it bought me some time. And so when I interviewed with Sherwin, I decided that the Sherwin opportunity was one I wanted more than Google. And so uh, when I sensed that they were going to similarly drag their feet, I let them know that I had a pending offer from Google the date that I expected it to be extended and that if they could beat Google with an offer that I wouldn't wait for the Google offer. I, I love that too because you're, you're leveraging this powerful thing called signaling. And just by saying that you have an offer from Google, you know, Google is perceived as a very, very high quality employer that screens their employees very well. And so to, to even just say that that's the potential employer, I think it enhances your own image. It's, it's like, oh, this person's really credible. I, I imagine that plays well in their perception of you as a candidate. Yeah, I, I think it did. Um, one, one other thing about Lovejoy is you, you had worked up to be general manager, and I, I haven't actually had a lot of GMs on the show. Could you talk about you know, what is a general manager and, and what was that life like? So in, in that situation, the, the, the additional challenge you have, which I, I know you as a tech founder have to deal with, is it's not just managing your employees, but also managing the, the family and shareholders and their expectations. Um, meeting with the board of directors, um, they had, the owner also had a president's forum. So, um, and, and managing up can be just as difficult as, as managing uh, the, the 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 folks down below. So just just, that, just because you climb the ladder doesn't mean that it's any easier. That's for sure. Mm. And and generally, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I, I imagine that in that general manager position, you you have um, it, it. You know, it's always struck me as the general manager position is almost like a a mini CEO, where you have responsibility for a a portion of the business or a segment of the business or a significant chunk of it. And generally, they'll, they'll call that as having P&L or profit and loss responsibility, which means that you've, mm -hmm. you've got a budget, you've got responsibility not just for the revenue, but also for the costs. And I think one of the things that many listeners might find appealing about a general manager position, you know, although it, it's 
difficult to obtain that or you might have to work up to it. It is, you know, the, in my view, it seems like the equivalent of being CEO of a, a unit. You have responsibility for every aspect. And particularly if you want to run a larger organization or if you want to start your own, it's a way to get um, in the driver's seat, but you still have, um, you still have other, you know, other people looking out for you. So it's not, it's not training wheels. I think that's like dumbing it down too much, but it's, it's all of the benefits of, of being in charge, but you also have uh, a good support system around you. Would, would, would you say that's true of your experience at Lovejoy? Absolutely. And, and I mean, one of the other things that I, I did, I did my, my career doesn't follow this perfectly, but there's the old adage that you should, uh, if you start with a large company, say you lateral to a higher title at a small company, and then you take that higher title and lateral to a large company. And that's kind of what I was able to do here because I had small company P&L experience um, with a lot of experience um, in the manufacturing environment. We actually manufacture components that go into factories, which means I had toward hundreds and hundreds of factories. And what I want to share when I had both P&L experience and I could walk around their facility um, with a lot of confidence. And so um, th they saw obviously those, those skill sets as relatively low risk relative to other candidates they would bring in from the outside to, to perform that job. That's great. I love that, 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 that um, concept you threw out of leveraging the title and, and, and going from, you know, you could, you could parachute into a smaller company with a bigger title or you know, if you do go to a bigger company, then you probably take on a, a smaller title, but it's, it's just all part of the decision of what, what matters to you and which things that you want to, to focus on optimizing. Um, so how did you make the switch then? Because it seems pretty different going from Sherman Williams, you're doing director of distribution, and then you go on to uh, ZipRecruiter in, in a very senior role as vice president of operations. How did that, um, how did that come about? So, um, as they say in a lot, a lot of, you never want to burn your bridges. And uh, the tech product manager I resigned on in Los Angeles when I was moving to Chicago to work for my sponsor, Dad, it turns out that uh, I thought I was making a good career move. It was probably the most expensive move I ever made in my life because he ended up being the CEO and co-founder of ZipRecruiter. And so um, I, I had good relations with him. My wife is from L.A. She likes an adventure. She never wanted to move back to L.A., they were headquartered there, but um, when he decided to open up his facility here and he reached out to me, um, I thought that we, we had never lived in Arizona. It sounded like a new challenge. And I, I told him that as long as I worked for him or his COO, I would, I would resign on this, this really cool opportunity I had at Sherwin. That's great. I mean, that's, that's a, uh, a prime time example of when, when people talk about your network or networking the fact that you had worked with this person, he knew you, he liked you, you were a known commodity, you had a relationship that, um, you know, I, I love the way you put it, you know, it may have cost you money going to that other job rather than maybe being along for the ride of founding ZipRecruiter, but no one can ever have that sort of insight in advance. But I, I love that thought that you maintained that, re that relationship, you preserved it. It's not like you um, flipped him the bird and, and, uh, and quit on the spot. I imagine you handled it pretty gracefully and he understood why you were leaving and that allowed you to have that door open to, to go back in. And, um, you know, that, that position one, he, you know, he, it might've been difficult had you not known him to obtain that position. And then two, the autonomy that you had in saying, this is the location I want to work from and I want to report to you or this other person that's, um, that would probably be difficult for someone who didn't know the CEO at all to, to really make the case for those, those maybe perks you would call them. Sure. And I, I guess one, one point of clarification though, is I actually came in as a, a director in to zip. And when I resigned in Sherwin, I, I was managing North of 300 employees. The warehouse was 750,000 square feet. I was, I was responsible for all paint distribution um, in the, the 12 Western States and two Canadian provinces. And when I left Sherwin for zip, I started with a team of six employees. That's great. The uh, the interview that I always think of on that that one of the very first interviews I did was with a guy named Jimmy Sopko. It's the sixth episode of Beyond the Uniform, and he went directly from active duty into Pinterest, and um, he started out in the customer support team. It was you know it was him at like age twenty eight or twenty nine, and everyone else around him was like twenty three years old. And so in some mm -hmm. ways it was a, a big step back in terms of title and responsibility and, and certainly ego and pay. 
And, you know, because of his work ethic, because of his uh, military experience, he was able to accelerate far beyond his peers and much faster and improve his value and, and work up very, very quickly. But it did take that step back and it did take really hustling and showing what he could do. And it sounds like you did a similar thing, which was you had this incredible amount of responsibility at Sherman Williams in terms of the number of employees and responsibility and even title, but you were willing to make a sacrifice, a, you know, what turned out to be, I imagine a short-term sacrifice, but you were willing to take that step back in terms of title and, and number of people you were managing and responsibility and just really proved yourself of not just doing your job, but it sounds like you were starting to add value beyond your specific role and title and being able to show them that you could contribute to the bigger team. And I imagine that that made it easier for them to uh, to promote you faster and give you more responsibility quicker. That's right. Yep. Um, it, it, for someone listening who's interested in operations, are there any skill gaps that they need to fill between their military service and, and doing something in operations? So, I mean... Uh... I'd say that the thing to really focus in on is your storytelling. And I know you just ran a number of uh, podcasts on storytelling, but um, storytelling is really, really powerful. Um, your first, especially your first role out of the military, they're going to hire you because of your, uh, your work ethic, your integrity, um, these things that they know about you, but also how you can connect that to how you're going to add value for their organization. Um, you can certainly try to, to, you know, throw some cert certificates or some, some reading relative to Lean, Six Sigma, Quick Response Manufacturing, that kind of stuff. Um, but really focus on whatever you're doing, figure out how, how that focuses into the story of why you and, and why it makes most sense to hire you for that specific role. Mm. That's great. Um, and I, I always all like, like to ask about resources of um, anything that's been helpful to you in your civilian career that could be books or conferences, programs, podcasts. Anything that you would recommend that listeners check out? Sure. Um, one book that the last three companies I've been at, I've had my entire management team read, um, is Leadership and Self-Deception um, by the Arbinger Institute. And, and what I, it's, it's written as a, a novel um, to kind of talk. It's, it's about a manager who comes into an organization that's struggling, and he has a mentor that comes alongside and helps coach him up in that organization. Um, but I really like it because it helps understand the EQ challenges of a civilian work work environment. Um, and I, again, the teams that I've had read this book, none of them were transitioning military, but I think uh, transitioning military would get a lot of insight out of it as well as just traditional managers because it, it tackles EQ challenges within a, a civilian workplace so well. Um, another thing is relative to conferences. Uh, this isn't necessarily specific to operations, but I would really recommend trying to find uh, some kind of job fairs uh, specific to the transitioning veterans if you can. I like it not only because they, they provide side doors, um, but because they let you figure out what you really want to do. Is I think a lot of people transition out of the military, they think I'm a project manager or I'm an operations person because that's what I've done. Uh, but there's also a number of other really great career fields out there. Uh, I'm, I'm in a call, contact center with uh, several hundred uh, inside sales professionals. Inside sales is a great uh, profession for uh, transitioning veterans, and I know a lot of transitioning veterans do very well in outside sales too. So, so getting to those conferences and talking about what what is available and what's a real option for you, I think think uh, could add a lot of value for for just about any transitioning veteran. That's great. Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. I, one last concept, and I, I reserve this really for the senior senior type folks who are, are transitioning out the twenty year plus veterans. Um, if you're going for high level roles. Uh, one thing I would also recommend considering is, is maybe checking out some books on how to interview for consulting companies like McKinsey or Bain. Um, you're going you're gonna to find that these higher level roles are going to ask behavioral type interview questions, and you're going to go against people that have these kind of backgrounds. And so if you can uh, articulate and formulate your responses in a way that comes across as really polished, uh, I think it would really help set you apart. That's great. And for listeners in the show notes at beyondtheuniform.io, I'll have links to everything that uh, Elliot's talked about, the um, Military Mojo, uh, Zip Recruiter, that uh, everything is mentioned, the books and conferences. Um, well, I always like to keep the last question open-ended, and, and that is, you know, what have we not talked about that you want to make sure you share with listeners before we wrap up? Um, the last thing I want to talk about is that 
well, well I, I think I think you probably experienced it with your fundraising and everything else, is that along the way to success in anything, there's lots and lots of failures. One thing that I haven't mentioned yet was that just before that SAC career fair where I had the Google and Sherwood and a couple other offers, I had an interview with Amazon. And it was a it was an interview that I thought that was was mine to be had, the, the job I felt uniquely qualified for. And I I'd almost taken the, the job as a given. And at the time I hadn't interviewed externally for ten years. And they came out with me with some of these behavioral based interview questions that I, I recommended grabbing those books for, for a McKinsey or Bain. And I totally blew the behavioral based interview question. I, I didn't even know know what kind of structure or formulation they were looking at. I didn't approach a problem right. And so because of that, I was passed over for a job that I, I still feel that I would have done extremely well at. And so because of that, I, I regrouped. I, I learned from it. I, I grabbed those books. I checked out those books. And by the time the SAC interview hit, uh, SAC interviews hit, I was able to really, really sail through those type of interview questions really well. That's great. It's, uh, it's refreshing to... It's always refreshing to hear people open up about failure, and I think that that is where all the growth comes from and all the learnings come from. And I think we're we're well acquainted with that, uh, you know, exercise analogy of tearing muscle and rebuilding it. And it, it seems like that process too. That all of these paths are, you know, everyone's career path is littered with failures and mistakes, and that the ability to learn from those things is what allows us to adapt and, and grow stronger and go further. So I appreciate your being candid about that. Well, thank, thank you again for your time. I uh, really appreciate this podcast. And uh, uh, in terms of storytelling, you do a fantastic job. And I, I certainly hope that uh, veterans listening to this program will, will, will appreciate how important that is. I think that uh, uh, EQ and ability to storytell is something that I know that I, I fully didn't appreciate. Um, until many years after transitioning out of the Air Force, it's just how important that really is. Awesome. Well, thanks for your story, Elliot, and thanks for, for, uh, for joining us today. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond the Uniform. There are over 200 free episodes at beyondtheuniform.io. They're classified by the industry of focus, the functional role the person plays, and more. Beyond the Uniform is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Justin Asiri. Our director of outreach, responsible for sponsorship and guest episodes, is Steve Bain. Our editor, responsible for the show notes and text transcripts for all episodes, is Kathleen Dillon. Our data analytics and insights advisor is Andrew Woolridge. If you are enjoying Beyond the Uniform, you can help us out by telling your veterans and friends in the military about this free resource. There is more information on the website about how you can sponsor an episode or donate to our program to help us grow the work that we're doing. Be sure to check out the coaching section of beyondtheuniform.io, where you can be paired with professional, subsidized coaches to help you figure out your next career move. You can sign up for our newsletter to be up to date on the latest happenings at Beyond the Uniform. And in each show notes section, there is a link to audible.com, which is providing a free audiobook of your choice to Beyond the Uniform listeners. You get a free book of your choosing, and Beyond the Uniform gets $15 to subsidize the cost of the show, regardless of whether you can continue with audible.com or not. Check that out and more in the show notes for this episode. Keep the feedback coming. Let me know what resources would help you in your career, and we'll do our best to make that happen. Take care, be safe, and I'll be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career.